As Albert Einstein once put it, Mathematics is the poetry of logical ideas. That doesn't mean we need to be poets to understand it. It just means that we can think of math as a kind of language that helps us express and develop new ideas in a logical way. Think about some of the most basic ways logic and patterns show up in our lives. Like even with how we think about our clothes. You know what your socks are and that they're different from say your gloves. And you probably don't get them confused and put your socks on your hands unless you're performing a sick sock puppet show. But both socks and gloves are things you wear and it's not weird to put them in the same closet. Maybe that sounds obvious, but knowing what different things are, what they do or don't have in common, and how they relate to each other is how we make sense of the world. Remarkably, making this sort of idea precise gives rise to a whole universe of concepts that extend into the realms of probability, logic, and even the nature of infinity. And as you might have guessed, the way we get there is with math, specifically with a branch of math called set theory which is kind of like the grammar of mathematics and gives us the tools and foundations we need to talk about the patterns that appear in math and in our world, ask questions, and come up with precise answers. I'm Jason Guglielmo, and this is Study Hall Real World College Math. Over the course of our first unit on set theory and counting, a lot of the abstract thinking we'll do will give us the tools we need to come up with solutions to more concrete problems. And this might be new for a lot of us. In school, you might have been taught math as sequences of operations or a bunch of calculations you make to get a certain answer. And sure, calculations are important, but like Einstein said, math is also about ideas that we can use to express things in a clear and logical way and combine to come up with new ideas. So instead of studying methods or techniques for solving certain problems, over the next few episodes, we're going to focus on building a kind of language for expressing mathematical ideas and keeping things clear and unambiguous. And since many mathematical ideas are just trying to precisely describe underlying patterns in the world, hopefully what we learn about set theory will feel intuitive, but maybe also weirdly specific. Like take the most basic and important object in set theory. You guessed it, a set. Much like the word in the English language, a set is a collection of objects. But when we talk about sets in math, we also mean something a bit more specific. We say a set is a well-defined collection of objects. That means we can definitively decide whether something is or isn't in a set. And if we don't have a way of deciding, then we don't have a set. For instance, we could talk about the collection of all published books written by John Green. Either John wrote the book or he didn't. So that's a set. But let's think about another group of things, like the collection of all the best tasting fruits. I'm ready to fight anyone who doesn't think mangoes are some of the best things they'll ever eat. But you might hate mangoes and think I'm ridiculous for not loving cherries. It's hard to argue there's an objective way to decide which fruits belong in the collection. So best tasting fruits do not make up a set using our precise math definition because it's not well-defined. Now, as mathematicians who need precise and clear language for building new ideas, unsurprisingly, we also have a word for whatever we're putting in the set. In the language of sets, something that belongs to a set is called an element or member of the set. For instance, The Fault in Our Stars is an element of the set of John Green books, but an absolutely remarkable thing is not an element of that set because John didn't write it no matter how many people confuse him with his brother Hank. As long as the collection is well-defined, pretty much anything can be an element of a set. But when we're dealing with math, the elements of a set are often mathematical objects, like numbers. Let's say our set contains all numbers divisible by two, or as they're more commonly called, even numbers, like two, four, six, eight, and so on. Just like our other examples, this set is well-defined since we can definitively say whether a number is or isn't divisible by two but there's something a little different with this set. In our first example about John's books, we know how large the set is because John has written seven books as of 2022, but there are way more than seven even numbers. We can keep adding two to any even number and get more and more even numbers forever. So the set of John Green books is finite, which means we can count the number of elements inside of it and stop counting at some point. But the set of even numbers is infinite, which means it goes on forever and will never finish counting the number of elements it contains. And that's totally fine. The point here is that there's no limit to how many elements can belong in a set. In math, infinitely big sets are pretty common, just like we saw for the set of even numbers. So John, you've got a lot of work ahead of you if you wanna catch up to the set of even numbers. Better, uh, better get to work. In math, we can get really specific about the words we use because we're trying to talk about really precise concepts. Then we take those concepts and fit them together to make something new, 
just like poets carefully choosing words and ideas to build a poem. And that's part of what can make math seem like a different language. In fact, it can look that way too. So far, we've described sets and their elements using words, but when we're working with sets in math, we'll also need a way of clearly expressing them visually. In general, the symbols we use for expressing math concepts in writing are called notation. And the notation might feel a little weird or unusual the first time we see it. But just like having specific words helps us communicate, by using a standard notation, we can express our mathematical ideas clearly and succinctly in different contexts and to different people. Let's start with a set. The notation for a set is often a set of curly brackets. You can think of these brackets as saying, I am a set, and any elements I have are inside of me, which makes sense because brackets usually contain something. As for what rule we use to build our set, or make it well-defined, one way we describe a set is to use a sentence, kind of like we've been doing. So we could just write whole numbers bigger than 13 between our curly brackets if we wanted to only talk about numbers bigger than 13 that don't have extra fractional bits. But other times it might be clearer, quicker, or even easier to write a set in a different way if we're going to keep referring to it. Like we can assign our set a letter that represents it. So that instead of writing out the full set every time, we can just refer to the letter. The convention, which is math speak for rules that people tend to follow so we all understand each other, is to use a capital letter for describing sets. We still have to make sure that people reading our work later understand what the heck we're saying. So for our set, if we wanted to use a capital A to refer to it, at some point we'd have to say that A is equal to our set. After that, we can use A to refer to our set as long as it doesn't have any other meaning in what we're doing. And now that we have a notation for sets, we can move on to their elements. We often refer to elements as belonging to a set, and we also have a special notation which means belongs to which looks a bit like a curvy capital E. So we'd write 20 belongs to the set of whole numbers bigger than 13. Or we could say 20 belongs to A, which we know from before is our set of whole numbers bigger than 13. In some cases, it can also be convenient to write or even define a set by writing out its members inside the curly brackets. Let's go back to the set of John Green books. For that set, we could put the title of each book he's written separated by a comma inside the curly brackets. Since this gives us a peek at the members of our set, like a mathematical lineup, we call this kind of notation roster form. But roster form can get a little messy if we have a finite set with a lot of elements or an infinite set, like for our set of even numbers or our set with numbers greater than 13. So especially in situations where our set is hard to describe in a short sentence, we can use a mathematical statement to define or build a set. This is called set builder notation. To use set builder notation, we start off inside the curly brackets and take some symbol, like the lowercase letter x, to stand in for any arbitrary element of our set. Then we draw a vertical line and write out the conditions that the elements satisfy. Or in other words, what has to be true for x to be in our set. If we're trying to describe the set of all whole numbers greater than 13, we say two things. One, that x is a whole number, which is the same as saying x belongs to the set of whole numbers. That set actually has its own special math notation in the form of a fancy letter n. Secondly, we write that x has to be greater than 13. This is a different condition from our first condition, so we separate them with a comma, just like we did for set elements. This way, someone could read this notation and build the set based on the conditions we listed. Now, that's a lot of ways to describe sets. And you might have some questions like, why use the letter X for the elements of our set? And what's with the big fancy N? These kinds of questions often come up on first contact with any type of math notation. Just like a language, what can feel strange and unintuitive becomes familiar the more you use it, even if the original notation or language seems made up. Because in many ways it is. But by seeing the same notation in different contexts, practicing math and using the ideas, the notation starts feeling more natural, like, X being used as a generic variable in trigonometry and probability tells you that if you see an X now, it might mean we're trying to explain how a particular piece of math applies to something in a general way. It just takes practice. And that's it. We've determined the basic language of sets to start our mathematical journey from. And just like language and grammar give us words to clearly describe our thoughts and reason things out, Set theory gives us some of our basic tools for thinking with math. Because it turns out, for lots of what we deal with in life and math, sets are a useful way of describing them. In the next episodes, we'll see how using sets to describe collections of things and exploring sets inside other sets helps us interrogate data, organize our possessions, 
explore the possible outcomes of our actions, and even try to predict the future. Thanks for watching Study Hall Real World College Math, which is produced by Arizona State University and the Crash Course team at Complexly. If you like this video, give us a like and a subscribe. You can learn more about ASU in the videos produced by Crash Course in the links in the description. See you next time.